Let me, before, uh, before we actually go into reception of AWGN, I was thinking, I looked at my notes, and uh, I kind of saw a, a little gap here. So let me fill in that gap, because uh, I, I wanted to, it seems like without it, it will look as if we skipped something. So uh, let's, let's uh, review a little bit what we've what we covered so far. We saw our signaling as using uh, these basis vectors, and we identified that you can signal with n equal 1, which are your pulse amplitude modulation signaling, or you can signal with n equal 2, uh, which is your QPS scale one. And the question is, how do you generalize this? Can you signal with n greater than 2? And can you have multi-dimensional uh, multi signaling where n is larger than 2? And uh, what do we need to have so that we signal with n greater than 2? We have to have a basis signal set, which are all orthogonal signals, and which are all mutually orthogonal to one another. And the thing is, how do we create that? And in our world, you know, ever since you were, I guess, from your freshman year, we love sinusoidal, right? We work a lot with sinusoidal. So the logical way to try to create this set is to work with sinusoids. I already discovered that if I'm on one uh, operating frequency, then, uh, then uh, I can have sine and cosine and modulate them independently because these two are orthogonal to one another. But that's it. I cannot be on the same frequency and have sinusoidals and have orthogonality because between sine and cosine I cover the entire you know, space with, that is on one frequency. So I need to move to other frequencies. And the question is here, you know, how do I make this orthogonality work? So to, uh, to pose this question differently, let's take a look at two sinusoidals that are some number of hertz apart and find out how many hertz apart do they need to be so that they become orthogonal. Okay? So first, let me, let's go and say signaling. This is, by the way, it's not in the notes. This is the gap that you're filling, so if you want to write. So let's say signaling interval. Well, let me just put the type in with n greater than 2. Let's call this capital T signaling interval. Alternative way of saying signaling interval is symbol duration. <clears throat> yeah, this you cannot even see this, right? So this is signaling interval. And this here says symbol duration. So what is that? Remember, in all our derivations so far, what I was doing is I would identify a certain interval from 0 to t and select one waveform, si of t, to do the signaling. And that, that waveform was carrying a certain number of bits. And, uh, and uh, is cons it is seen as a linear combination of your basis signaling waveforms, right? basis vectors. So let's T be signaling interval, and let me take a look at two sinusoidals, psi 1, which is having, let's say, magnitude square root of 2, cosine of 2 pi f 0 t plus some angle alpha 1. And let me take a different sinusoidal, psi 2, having a square root of 2, cosine 2 pi f0 plus delta f t plus alpha 2. Okay? Now, what, what is happening here? I have two sinusoidals with, uh, I can actually make them different magnitudes. So let me, let me just do that. Call this a1 and call this a2. They have different magnitudes and then they're separated by delta f in a frequency domain. So if I were to plot this in a frequency domain, here's what you have. You have, this is frequency axis, and I'm drawing this one-sided. So this is the first sinusoidal, F0. 
And the second sinusoidal is F0 plus delta F. So there's a delta F separation between them. First one is magnitude A1, the magnitude A2. And my question is, if I observe these two sinusoidals on this interval T, how large the separation in the frequency domain needs to be before they become orthogonal? Right? That's the, that's the answer. That's the question here. So how do I do orthogonality? Well, this is what I'm trying to, uh, trying to do. I'm trying to form the product of these two, and I want this to be equal to 0. How do I form the product? It's integral from 0 to t, a1 cosine of 2 pi f0 t plus alpha 1 times a2 times cosine of 2 pi f0 plus delta f t plus alpha 2 dt. That's the dot product between them. And uh, this is equal to what? If I see this as a multiplication of the two cosines, then I have this a1, a2 in over 2, integral from 0 to t, cosine of the sum, 2 pi, 2 f0 t, uh, 2 f0 plus delta f, t plus alpha 1 plus alpha 2 dt. Right? That's the first. I have cosine alpha, cosine beta, so it's one half cosine of the sum and then plus uh, one half cosine of the difference. So this becomes plus integral from zero to t, cosine of the difference is uh, two pi delta f t plus alpha one minus alpha two, and uh, then dt, and then close the square bracket. Now. What is the value of this first integral? It's a, it's a average of a cosine, right? We, all, we cannot assume that this t, uh, t is much larger than 1 over f0. In other words, over this signaling interval, I have many, many periods of the sinusoidal. So I'm actually averaging the sinusoidal across this entire signaling period. And what do I get? Zero. zero, right? So this one is e either exactly zero if uh, if this the number of uh, if the t is integer multiple of n over one and zero. But even if it's not, since this is much greater than this, then uh, then uh, this is very very close to zero. So taking this into account, then I have a one, a two, over two. Now, this one, I cannot assume it's zero because this delta f is, I'm actually looking how small this delta f can be so, so that I maintain orthogonality. So this may be actually uh, sinusoidal or very small frequency. That means that uh, this condition will not hold for, for the second one. But I can easily integrate the second one. What is the integral of the cosine? It's going to be sine <coughs> of 2 pi delta f plus alpha 1 minus alpha 2. You can do it now if you want. Okay. Well, let's finish for today. Uh, alpha 1 minus alpha 2. So there's a t. Oh, so I change all of this. Alpha 2 pi delta f t plus alpha 1 minus alpha 2. And uh, divided by 2 pi delta f. And this evaluated from 0 to t. Right? If I didn't mess up with integration. Right? So this is, this is correct. Make sure you, you follow and, and uh, make sure that I don't make any mistakes. So when you do this, this becomes a1, a2 over 4 pi <coughs> delta f. And then you have sine of 2 pi delta f t plus alpha 1 minus alpha 2. And then that minus sine of alpha 1 minus alpha 2. And this has to be equal to 0. Now, when is this equal to 0? Obviously, this is some constant that does not influence the result. 
This is equal to zero when these two signs are equal. So what can you tell me about this? This is equal to what? When does sign repeat itself? Uh, integer uh, number of 2 pi. Two pi. So what is the smaller repetition? 2 pi, right? Two pi. So that means that 2 pi delta f t is equal to 2 pi, right? right? That's the first repetition. If you start from sine 1, alpha 1 minus alpha 2, the next time this comes is plus, plus 2 pi, right? right? So this <coughs> has to be equal to 2 pi. So these two functions are orthogonal. Psi 1 of t and dot product with psi 2 of t is equal to 0 if 2, uh, I would say, if 2 pi delta f t is equal to 2 pi. So what is delta f? Is equal to 1 over t. Okay? So now let's uh, let's uh, think about it, this this result here. Now I have a means of creating potentially infinite number of infinite number of orthogonal sines and cosines. Let's say let's say uh, let me just do and work an example before I generalize. This. Let's say I want to have n equal four, just for the sake of example. So. And let's say my t is equal to 0 0.1 milliseconds. That's the, that's the signaling <coughs> period that I'm going to use. I'm going to uh, signal every 0.1 milliseconds. So what should be delta f? Delta f is 1 over t, which is giving me 10 kilohertz. Right? So now I can pick two sinusoidal, uh, four uh, basis vectors. Phi 1 of t is going to be, let's say, square root of 2 cosine 2 pi f0 t, uh, just f0 t. Then psi 2 of t is going to be square root of 2 sine 2 pi f0 t. Then psi 3 of t, I'm going to say square root of 2 cosine 2 pi F0 plus 10 kilohertz. And then psi 3 of t, psi 4 of t, apologize, is square root of 2 times psi times 2 pi, there's t missing here, right? Uh, 2 pi F0 plus 10 kilohertz t, right? So how many basis vectors I have here? Four. Four, right? I have cosine and sine at f0, cosine and sine at, uh, at uh, f0 plus 10 kilohertz. They are mutually, mutually orthogonal, and then because they are separated uh, by 10 kilohertz, and the signaling period is 0.1 milliseconds, they are all orthogonal. Right? How do I make this 6? Well, I take 5, 5, 5 is going to be square root of 2 cosine 2 pi f0 plus 20 kilohertz, and then sine 20 kilohertz. And by doing that, you can actually generate, uh, as, as I said, infinite number of carriers that are all going to be mutually orthogonal. Does anybody know what is it that I'm really talking about? Increasing dimension. No, no, what is, what is, what is the modulation scheme that I'm talking about? OFDM. OFDM, DM. right? This is OFDM. So how do we see O of the n? You can see that as, as uh, n different carriers that are mutually orthogonal, so that, that they are all separated with the exact frequencies, a separation that is inverse of the symbol duration. And on each one of them, I'm going to use, for example, QPSK. Or, or each one of them, I can use any qua mod. Qua mod uh, modulation scheme. And that's how a lot of modern communication systems are. The exact reasons why that's the case, we actually cover in RF propagation. It's related to how large your coherence bandwidth is in different channel types. So that kind of gives you uh, what this separation needs to be. But from the standpoint of this course, you can see that now the common way for us to generate a basis vector set or basis signal set 
is actually to pick sinusoidals that are equally spaced in a frequency domain and that spacing is inverse proportional to the signaling time and then you use QAM or, or, or uh, usually QAM on each one of these individual carriers. Now, this seems like a little bit, uh, how should I say, hard thing to do. If you think about this indirectly and in the way how I've been drawing modulators so far, it seems like you need one oscillator to do this, right? And then you need another oscillator for these two carriers, right? Because I need to one in quadrature, then the second in quadrature, third in quadrature. If I have 256, it seems that I would need 256 different, uh, different uh, I and Q modulators to modulate this. And this is how it starts. But then you do some math and it will demonstrate that you actually get the same, uh, that you can implement this very efficiently using something that's called a fast Fourier transform. As a matter of fact, you, you do e inverse fast Fourier transform in the transmitter and fast Fourier transform in the receiver. This is beyond the scope of this. I, I'm actually going to teach that in some other courses. But it turns out that this is a really, really good modulation scheme when you're trying to pack a lot of bits into the channel, when you're after, after very high spectral efficiency and when your peak to average power ratio is, is not an issue. And that's the case in a lot of high capacity systems that we're dealing with. If you think about your Wi-Fi, this 802.11, it is using this kind of approach. If you think about LTE, fourth generation cellular, it is using this approach. If you look at your ADSL lines, they're using this kind of approach. As a matter of fact, this is used, as I said, everywhere where you don't, where you're really looking to pack a lot of bits per hertz, where you're really constrained in frequency domain, and you're trying to pack as much capacity as you can in whatever is the bandwidth that you have. The price you pay is, is you cannot go far, because what happens is your, uh, your peak to average power ratio is very large, you know, your peak power is very large when compared to your average power. And to operate within a linear region of your amplifier, you have to back off. So you have to operate at much lower powers, which kind of limit your reach, limit how far you can go. And But in a lot of systems, that's not an issue. In Wi-Fi, you want to go maybe 10 meters, 20 meters. In LTE, you go a few hundred meters, because the cell sites are relatively small. In uh, ADSL, you don't go anywhere, right? You have your your uh, your line, and theoretically, you can actually pump as much power as you want. It's just that it gets hot, you know, as, as a result of that. And there are a lot of cases where, where this range, where the, where the range is not so important, but the data rate is of a paramount importance, and that's where you use it. Okay. Well, you're going to run into one of them if you stay in wireless. I know a lot of you aspire to do so. And you look at all the contemporary systems, you know, that, that we have in, in operation today, they're all having OFDN as, as one of the modulation schemes. And I already mentioned Wi-Fi, uh, LTE, uh, if you look at, there is something, WiMAX, exactly. There is something that is called a 211 ad which is a new uh, AC and AD. Uh, AD is a 60 gigahertz. The, the one uh, wireless LAN for 60 gigahertz, it is using also 80211 as one of the physical air option. And there's wireless high definition, 802.15.3c, all of them are using you know, uh, this kind of approach on the physical air. All right, from this course, it's really what is important for me to show you how you generalize and go to n greater than two. You know, the real reason for the use of this is beyond the scope of this course. And as I said, we talk about this a little bit in a, in wireless RF propagation class where you actually can show that this is actually the best way to overcome highly set frequency selective channel that, that is broadband. It's, you know, when you have a wide channel because of its frequency selectivity, the best way to deal with it is not to see it as one monolithic channel, but to see its individual pieces that are that are uh, 
that are experiencing flat fading and then kind of instead of sending one carrier with a high data rate, you send many carriers with low data rates. Go ahead. So <coughs> if the limitations on the, the power ramp, why can't they just have separate power ramps for each set of frequency that's tuned for that? Uh, that that kind of that kind of implies that I'm that I'm making this just like I said directly from here. And, and you don't don't do that because you know even if you try to do what you just said, what 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 uh, Joseph is saying? Well, why don't I have separate amplifier for each one of the frequencies? Well, let's think about it. what does that mean. That means let's say n is equal to to two fifty six, and it can be larger. It can be two thousand forty eight or even four thousand ninety six. So that means my transmitter has to have four thousand and ninety six quadrature modulators, each one having a power amplifier, proper, you know, uh, transmission filter, even little antenna, right? So how, how is it going to look like, right? And even if I make to manage to build it, how do I make all of these oscillators, you know, uh, synchro synchronize with each other? And how do I make sure that this, this theoretical delta F is maintained? It's impossible, right? So, so this kind of approach is known for a long time, right? It was, it, you know, it's it's very easy mathematically. You know, when you're when you have some spare time, you play with and come with all sorts of ideas. But it, practically, it was not feasible before we figure out how to implement it using uh, fast Fourier transform. And then what it turns out in fast Fourier trans by using fast Fourier transform. You don't do it this way. You see it this way. This is what happens. But you actually do everything in the baseband. And then once you're done, then you move the whole signal to one case. Right? It's very interesting. We don't have time in this course. I'll go over that in some of the courses. But uh, it's, very, it's very interesting. It's one of those things where, where, where math wins. Right? You kind of, you know, just by by doing some math, you say, okay, there's this completely novel way of doing it. The result is same, but from the implementation standpoint, it's actually, you know, order of magnitude easier to do. Right. All right, so, so that's a generalization. Now, this kind of completes the, the part of the modulation part. There's many, many modulation schemes. And, and to be honest with you, I have covered the most, the simplest one. Right. There, there are a lo lot of, lot of uh, uh, what we call nonlinear modulation schemes that use like uh, uh, nonlinear modulation scheme, uh, all sorts of different types how you pack your bits on the carry. Regardless of what the scheme is, <coughs> the, I, the result is similar, right? What you're actually doing, you're trying to put your bits on the carry. And, uh, Different schemes are done for different reasons, different robustness towards different impairments. And if you stay in this area, you're going you're to learn them all, uh, learn many, many more of them. But they don't, uh, my, my, my take at this point is they're not going to add, by going in, into some additional, I'm not going to add anything qualitatively new. I'm just going to look at individual nuances. So what I'm going to do from this point on, I'm going to now assume that I have modulated my signals by one of these modulation schemes. And we're going to look at the receiver. The receiver is the, the, the guy that does the hard part. You know, remember, I can, you know, regardless of how hard this is, I can always modulate, right? And I send a signal. But then the signal gets all modified and, and funny, and add noise gets added. And now the receiver needs to look at this signal and get those bits out. And that's a very difficult task, especially in channels like a wireless communication channel where you have multipath and all sorts of interference, noise, all sorts of uh, impairments that you're dealing with. So let us switch our attention to the receiver and we're going to talk about how do you actually demodulate uh, and, and get your information back after it travels through the channel and gets corrupted by noise. In this case, we're again looking at the simplest channel, which is infinite in bandwidth, meaning that it does not modify the sp uh, frequency <coughs> content of the signal, but it adds the noise. And the noise is of a special characteristics. It's white in a frequency domain, 
it is Gaussian in the amplitude domain and it adds to the signal. It's additive in, in nature. So let's uh, switch gears to the receiver. So reception of uh, digitally modulated signals. And uh, AWG. So here's our block diagram. We have a transmitter. You're sending one of n capital possibilities, like m is 1 or 2 or up to n. So you have n different waveforms at your disposal, depending you know, on your bit combination that came into transmitter. You're picking one of n possibilities. You're sending this over. Uh, it gets corrupted with noise, n of t, and you see, receive this signal. R of T, right? And T here, we're going to limit our attention to only one signaling period. So that's also, also slightly uh, suboptimal, actually quite a bit suboptimal because you can, there are, certain, there's, uh, there are gains to be, uh, I guess, obtained by looking at uh, several symbol intervals at a time. But, you know, let's tackle the first and, and the simplest case, and then we'll, then we'll expand from there. Um, what do we know here? This m is usually 2 to the n, right? Uh, where n is number of bits, all bits per signal. You know, usually we, we have uh, 2 to the n, and we discussed that last time, uh, different symbols in our signaling set. And that, you know, in QPSK, uh, n is equal to 2, 2 bits at a time, so I end up with the 4 waveforms. In 16 quam, n is equal to what? n is equal to 4, I'm encoding 4 bits at a time, therefore I have 16 different waveforms that I can possibly put on this, on this line. Now, this is the first thing I know. The second thing I know is this n of t is uh, uh, Gaussian in amplitude domain. So n of t is going to follow the Gaussian distribution 0, c. I'm going to assume it's Gaussian, also I'm going to assume it's zero mean, right? It doesn't say uh, zero mean Gaussian here, but it's assumed it's, it's uh, zero mean because we're talking about the noise. Noise cannot have a DC component, otherwise we'll solve the energy problems of this world, right? You just let the noise charge your battery. It, it, it cannot do that, right? So, so noise, it's always fair assumption to assume that it's, it's zero mean and it has some variations that are characterized by the C. <coughs> it is white, so white, which means that the power spectral density of the noise, N, Sn of f, is N0 over 2. This is our double side. which is, means for every f, right? When I write Sn, when I write S, I, I mean double-sided power spectral density. I notice there is a, there is a, uh, oh, there is an error in notes. There's one over two missing. And uh, I have this T, T is a signaling period. So the duration of the period is, uh, the signaling period is T. And then your symbol rate is going to be, 
Uh, so I can say here T is symbol duration. The bit uh, duration is going to be T over N. The symbol rate is going to be 1 over, so this is bit duration. This is your symbol rate. And then what is your bit rate? Rb is going to be n times r. That's a bit rate. Right, so if I have, for example, qpsk, my n is equal to 2. I'm encoding 2 bits at a time. So for every 2 bits, I'm going to change my symbol. Right? So my symbol rate is going to be half of the bit rate, or which is you know, dual of this statement, my symbol time is going to last two times the, the bit. Now, what, does, uh, what happens, you know, what does the receiver need to do? So the receiver performs two tasks. It is convenient at this point to see them as separate, right? First task is demodulation. And the second task is detection. To understand what is going on here, let me, uh, let's first understand what is it that the noise does. We already, let's say we're using two-dimensional signal. Let's say this is my SM. What does, what does this mean? I have two basis vectors, say sine and cosine, and I'm creating my uh, signal as a mixture of the sine and cosine, picking one of the points in this constellation space. Now, if you look at a vector, if you look at your noise, Right, over signaling interval. It's a signal as well. Right? If you look at, uh, let's say, I observe from 0 to t, and this is what my noise looks like. So this is n of t. And I add this to my SM. You know, we're going to look into that more strictly, but the result of that you can even see at this point. I can try to make this noise out of the silent process. I may not be completely successful, but I can approximate. And one of the problems you have for homework tries to show you how you do that. So if I have a sine and cosine, let's say I try to make this, and I end up with, uh, with this, right? this signal. Now, what you need to understand is this signal gets added to your original signal. So as a result of this, this constellation point is moved, right? Because you have, essentially have two vectors that are adding together. So you, let's say this is your noise, or noise projected, uh, how do I call it, this N, uh, in, this, in this vector space. So this is, a, strictly te technically speaking, this is a portion of the noise that resides in the, spec in the space spanned by Psi 1 and Psi 2. Right? Go ahead. Is that a noise, Gaussian noise? Yeah. yeah. It's a Gaussian noise, right? It's Gaussian and white at the same time. Okay. But regardless, I mean, whatever noise, even if it's interference or even if it's another signal, right? What happens is it, this can be understood as another point in this space or another vector in this space. So as a result of the presence of this noise, this R of T is going to be away from the actual constellation point. This is my R of T. Okay? Or, or since it's not R of T, it's just R. Right, because I'm now in a signal space. Now. So here's what, what, uh, how you should think about it. And, and uh, I kind of talk that way joke, jokingly because it's, it's a good analogy, right? Think about, you know, you, you saw those constellations. They are, they are essentially, uh, you know, points in this space. Uh, think about a guy throwing a dart, right, trying to hit this point. Ideally, let's say he's a very good... Uh, in, in playing darts, and this, he just came to the bar, so you know, before drinking anything, <laughs> he's, he's hitting this point, right? There's very little noise, right? So there's no noise, I, I throw the dart, and, and it hits here. But as the night progresses, 
uh, you know, because of more noise <laughs> introduced in the system, he starts throwing the dart all over the place, right? And that's what actually happens. You know, there is this, you know, uh, there is, I'm sending a signal SM of T, and then there's this additive noise that is actually adding to the signal. And then when I look at that signal as it arrives, I can think of it as a different point in the constellation space that is perturbed by the vector, by, by the random vector n that it picked up along the line. Go ahead. So is there any like limit for whenever you want to like put the noise over there, I mean the dart? Is There's there a no limit, limit on what? On, on how much you can drink? Uh, <laughs> what, what happens the dart. is... You can like throw the dart. What happens is as you add more and more noise, your ability to hit close to this point is going to be smaller and smaller. So what initially may start as a small cloud and may actually grow as, as your probability of getting you know, away from the actual point is becoming you know, bigger. bigger and bigger. And uh, ultimately, you're so imprecise that you're throwing everywhere in here. So it will be like uh, a circle. Yeah, it becomes really large area that you're throwing, right? So now, let's take a look at receiver. What does receiver do? Well, the receiver does two things. It observes the point, right? That's a signal. And the first thing it does, it, it demodulates. So it takes your point and translates that into a vector, R1, R2, which, which means nothing but take the signal that I have received and decompose that along the basis vector. You know, tell me how much in what I have received, I have how much of the Psi 1 I have, and how much of the Psi 2 I have. This is the demodulation part. It will take the whatever it has received and decompose that along the basis vectors. How do we do the decomposition? We take what? How do I find how much of the Psi 1 is in R? I take the dot product, the dot product mm -hmm. between R and Psi 1 and I take the dot product with R and Psi 2, and I'm going to get two values, psi one, R1 and R2. That tells me, okay, this signal that I have received has this much of a Psi 1 and this much of the Psi 2. So that's what we call demodulation. The second part is the detection. You know, uh, the in detection part, the receiver makes decisions. R that I have received now as a vector, I'm going to make the decision decide <coughs> on what is the SM. So I'm going to look at this vector and I'm going to say, okay, it has this much psi 1, this much psi 2. It has to be that this, this is what has been sent. And if my noise is relatively small, my decision making becomes relatively easy, right? If the cloud is here, you know, at the beginning of the night, I know where the guy is trying to throw. But as the noise becomes larger and the points the start falling in here, my ability to make a correct decision becomes limited, right? A lot of times I'm going to be making errors because the point is going to suggest something different. And, and uh, that's how we, that's why that's how this whole thing works. Now, also here, you can build a case why you use digital modulation. In analog, what is it that we're trying to do? In the analog, we are actually trying to remove some of this noise. And some of it you can remove through filtering, mm -hmm. but a lot of it that falls within the same spectral band as your signal is passed to the user, right? The user sees in-band noise, right, or hears in-band noise. Uh, so, noise rejection is a more difficult task than, uh, than detection here, right? You can see easily that as long as, as these points are not falling, you know, in, some, in these other quadrants, even if it falls here and it falls here, I can make a correct decision and I actually remove the entire noise because once I make the correct decision, I don't really care about the original signal. That's, you know, you keep the original signal, I know it was, I can regenerate it locally, right? 
So I make the correct decision. As a matter of fact, here I make the decision, if it falls anywhere in this quadrant, I'm going to have a decision that it's 0, 0. And no noise is passed, right? The noise is eliminated completely. The, the process of decision making and detection is much more robust. Because all I need to do is recognize what has been sent. And as long as it is not disturbed, de destroyed by the point of no recognition, my communication still survives, right? I send you the, you know, if I send you a pulse, and there's a lot, let's say I send you this, and I have option of sending you this or this. And let's say what comes looks like this. Which one is? Of course, the first it's the first one, right? And how I'm going to determine it? Well, I'm going to take the dot product between this or the dot product with this, or in other words, of saying that I'm going to correlate this with this or correlate this with this, and whichever one gives me the larger correlation, I decide it is this guy. And after that, what I'm passing to the uh, further down the line is this. Where is the noise? It's gone, right? Gone because I made the correct decision. So, so that's how, how the whole thing works. Let's just, uh, let's just now fill in all the blanks, you know, behind the theory, right? This is, this is very easy to, uh, I guess, uh, explain, but let's now put some math, and hopefully the math is not going to obscure the main message. So the modulation. So that's the first out of the two tasks. First, we're going to talk about how you demodulate, and then the second task is going to be how you do the decision making. So correlation time. We here's what we're receiving. We're receiving R of t, which is going to be SM of T plus N of T, right, for some M, right, this is my received signal. So what does the modulation do? You can think of it as a, as a block that feeds R of T at the input, and it gives me these coordinates, R1, R2, Rn. N is the basis, uh, basis signal set side. I mean, I'm, I'm writing it as N, but really it's 2, right, for what we're concerned in this course. You're going to get two, uh, 2 coordinates, but let's assume, you know, that in general you can get N, because you can have N different basis vectors. How are you going to generate, so this is some vector R1, R2, all the way to Rn. How do I uh, generate Rk? Well, we know Rk is going to be R of t in dot product with psi k of t. That's a projection of the received signal onto the basis signal psi k of t. So this is, in other words, dot product 0 to t r of t times psi k of t dt. <coughs> so if I now substitute what r of t is, then this is an integral from 0 to t sm of t plus n of t times psi k of t dt. But I can now uh, split this into two integrals and say Rk is going to be equal to integral from 0 to t as m of t times psi k of t dt plus integral from 0 to t n of t times psi k of t dt. This is where the additive nature of the noise comes to play, right? 
Because now, this first part, I know what it is. It's my SNK, right? It's the coordinate of this, uh, of this transmitted signal in, uh, along, the K, along the K basis vector. So this is the projection of my, of my original signal onto the basis signal. And now what is this part? This is my NK, which is the projection of the noise along the, along the basis signal psi K of T. So I cannot have a, since the noise is additive, I cannot have a superposition here and addition in the coordinate space as well, where my coordinate of this RK is whatever was the coordinate originally and some random perturbation along that particular, particular axis. So how would my cor correlation receiver look like? So outline of correlation receiver. Will be something like this. I have R of T. I have um, here multiply with psi 1 of T. And then I have to integrate from 0 to T dt. And uh, sample at the end to get my R1. And then I have another branch where I have psi 2 of T integral from 0 to t dt to get r2 and as long as you know I keep on going you know for how many n psi n of t integral 0 to t dt r n so this is a block diagram of what is called correlating receiver or correlation receiver you have n individual branches one of them dedicated to each one of the basis vectors. And what you're doing, you're taking your received signal and you're projecting that along these basic signals. In each case, you're going to get one coordinate. And the output of this process, you're going to get another point in your constellation space that is hopefully close to the points, to the points of your original, original signal, right? So, so <coughs> <coughs> original signal. This R1 is going to be your SM1 plus N1. This is going to be SM2 plus N2. It's going to be SMN plus NN. And this now is passed to detect. Okay. Okay, so now this is all nice, but one thing that uh, we know that is not really built into this. We can, although this is general in a mathematical sense, one big thing is missing. We know that these psi's are usually sine and cosines. Furthermore, we know that they're of a relatively high frequency, right? So let's take a look at n equal two. This is a sine, cosine, and this is a sine. But these psi's are generated at the receiver. They're not the same size, you know, we would like them to be the same size, but they're not the same size as the one that I use as a transmitter. What is different? The frequency might be slightly different because I have, even though we have oscillators that are very stable, you know, the difference might be there. Also, you know very well that not only that I need to have my uh, frequency synchronized, but my phase as well. Because if the phase is not synchronized, it can turn my cosine into sine, turn phi 1 into psi 2, and so on. So the big problem with this, this transmitter and receiver, uh, uh, with the correlating receiver, is really that you're generating these psi's locally, and you have to synchronize, in case of sine and cosine, to the incoming, incoming signal. And that problem is solved. I mean, it's, it's, it's not... Uh, not I guess it's hard, but it's not unsolvable. We have something that we call phase lock loops, which are relatively complex pieces of electronics that accomplish this uh, synchronization in a phase and a frequency. But there is an alternative way of, of achieving the same thing. And this is through what we call matched filter. So let's look at demodulation with the matched filter.
Now, let's take a look at what RK is. RK is integral from 0 to t, r of tau times psi k of tau d tau. Right? What is it that I'm doing? I'm saying that the k coordinate is a dot product between your received signal and your basis vector. Now, let's, let's do this. Let's uh, consider a filter that has an impulse response age of t, now let's say hk of t, that I'm gonna that I'm gonna feed with r of t. And what is gonna be the output of that filter? yk of t. What, <laughs> what is yk of t? If this is a linear filter, what how do I get yk of t? Convolution. Convolution, right? So this is r of t convolved with hk of t which I know is integral r of tau h of t minus tau d tau and let's say 0 to t because this r of t is only existing in the signaling interval after that it does not exist <coughs> sorry so sorry as you be tau t, t, t right <coughs> but let's look at yk of t. That's the time where I'm going to actually make a, make a, a decision of, you know, observe what the output is. So at the capital T, this becomes 0 to capital T, r of tau, h of t minus tau, d. <coughs> Sorry, capital t minus so now, uh, so I have a filter that I feed my input signal, and I, at the time, t equal to capital T, this is the value that I get, right? Now, I can compare these two, and I can say something like this. What needs to happen uh, if desired that this yk of t is equal to rk, what needs to happen if I want this value at this filter at the time t equal to capital T to be the same as this? What needs to happen between these two? You see that they're almost of the same form. The filter needs to be the size. There you go. So I, I can make that happen if my x age of t minus tau is the same of psi k. Okay. This is k. Psi k of tau. If I design a filter that has an impulse response that is related to my basis vector like this, then I can actually do just filter. I don't need to synchronize anything. If the filter is designed, it sits there and waits. And when there's a signal, it automatically takes the dot product. I don't have to synchronize. <coughs> I have, don't have to regenerate my local psi, right? Because I already did that by, by crafting this impulse response. If I rewrite this slightly different, if I instead of if <laughs> t minus tau, I call that t, then this tau becomes uh, capital T minus t then I can write something like this. This is the same, but just uh, changing the variables. <coughs> changing variables, so I can say the impulse response of the filter H K of T needs to be equal to psi of T minus T, or I can write that as psi minus T minus capital T, right? For for the reason that I'm going to explain in just a second. This filter, this is K. 
This filter is referred to as matched filter. <coughs> it is called matched because its impulse response matches your basis, basis signal, your side of T. How do you generate this filter? Well, let's, uh, let's look at an example. Let's say your psi of t looks like this. All right? This is capital T. So it kind of, I'm just draw, <coughs> drawing, <coughs> drawing this some arbitrary shape. So you do two operations. First operation, you can see here, there's minus t. So what minus t means, you are flipping this. Right. So instead of, uh, if I were to draw phi of minus t, how would it look like? It look like this, right? right? Going this way, in a negative t. And then in a negative t, t direction, I have to delay it by, by, by capital T. So your, so this is dot, 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 psi of minus t, uh, or I should say, t minus t <coughs> is the same guy but delayed like this. Right, so this is the solid, solid. <coughs> so you take, <coughs> take your basis filter, how do you generate your matched filter impulse response? You take this guy by the tail and you flip it over and then you push him to the same interval from 0 to t. Right? Okay, this is a this is essentially mirror image of this. If you treat y axis as a as a mirror, and then you take whatever you have in this slide and you by t. So, outline of the matched filter receiver. <coughs> so, matched filter receiver looks like this: R of t, and then you have bank of filters. This is your H one of t. H2 of t all the way to H n of t. And then here you're going to sample at uh, the integer uh, increments of capital T, getting R1, R2, Rn. As I said, this is kind of beautiful because these filters are, are, are passive and then you don't have to do synchronization with the income here. Now, that's again theoretically. What, what practically happens here? If you look at your receiver, and, and my background is I'm going to draw you a wireless receiver, how it might look like. You're going to have, usually this is how you, the receiver looks like. You have your, what we call front end filter, which is essentially, uh, let me just say like this, it's a bandpass filter, usually meant to roughly filter the, the frequency range in which you're working and reject most of the noise and interference. Then you have something that's called LNA, low noise amplifier. Why is it important to be low noise? Because this is the guy that determines the noise figure and therefore sensitivity of your, of your, uh, of your uh, receiver. Then you have usually something that we call mixer which translates this, uh, what is called RF front end, RF frequency band, into something that's called IF. So this is your local oscillator into IF, where you have your channel filtering, really pick the, the bandwidth of, uh, that, you, that you're interested, and here you have high gain amplifier, uh, or power amplifier that, uh, that you are that you are, so this is what we call receiver front end, and this is your I. So at this point is where your R of T happens. In older systems, you actually try to implement the further stages in analog. But in modern systems, what, what happens here is you go from analog to digital. So what is happening here you know, this is now continuation. You have your R of N, where N is sampled as sufficiently great. 
And then, really, in algorithmically, you take this R of n and you multiply that with psi 1 of n and psi 2 of n. And then this goes into base band process. Now, if you look at this now, what, what is happening here? This is software, right? This, so this is RF, IF, then you kind of leave the animal world, and this is all done in software. Then mathematically, what the mesh filter does and what the correlating receiver does are identical code. Right? In, in contemporary receivers, that's all the same. Right, so really, it's it's one the same whether you are talking about mesh filter or you're talking about correlating receiver. So just be aware of it. But this is how most of the contemporary receivers work. There is an attempt to actually get rid of <coughs> this stage here <coughs> and try to move this analog to digital conversion all the way up to here. These are what we call direct conversion receiver. Uh, sorry. Uh, take this LO and make it the same as the RF so that you move everything to the base pen in one step. This is what we call direct conversion receiver. And they are they are they have their own problems related to <coughs> relating to usually canceling the DC components and stuff like that. But but this is a what we call a super heterodyne receiver or one stage super heterodyne receiver. Sometimes if this frequency is very high, you may have two stages of the local oscillators. Before you. Yeah. But in all contemporary receivers, we tend to do all of our processing in a basement, and that we tend to do that in DSP. Right? So we kind of take it all the way to here, and then after that, you, you convert to numbers, and then you write the code that actually does your reception instead of trying to make everything in electronics. And that's yet another another uh, uh, justification for going digital right? because you, you can have uh, much much uh, <coughs> more robust receiver if you make everything soft than trying to work with the components that are subject to aging corrosion and all sorts of things <coughs> okay so um, we don't have much time, so let me tell you what where where we're going, and we're going to finish the rest of it uh, the next time. Uh, I kind of presented one thing to you, and you took it at a face value, right? I said, okay, the way how the receiver works, it will take the dot products and all of that, and we all understand at this point that uh, hopefully after going through this, that this is one way that it can work, right? I can get my coordinates are by taking both product against the basis factors and passing that to the detector I'll, I'll get my bits back but what I haven't shown and it should be the question on your mind is is this, is this the only way how this can be done and in an even more pressing question if there are multiple ways how this can be done is this the best way or is there a better way and what we're going to show next time is that by using match filter or correlating receiver, you actually, you're optimal in the sense of the signal to noise ratio. In other words, <coughs> there is no better scheme for the reception of the signal than this one if your objective is to maximize signal to noise ratio. Uh, why do we want to maximize signal to noise ratio? To make our detection easier, right? So that we get rid of as much noise as we can before we try to make any decisions. So what we're going to do next time, we're going to say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. Is there a better way? And what you will find out will strictly prove that there is no better way, that this is the most optimal way of doing the reception. And uh, going back to our earlier story about different domains, we're going to look at this in time domain and we're going to prove it in time domain, but it, it will not become clear to us why is this the best way of doing it until we look what actually happens in frequency. And uh, 
you know what you will find out it's it's not it should not surprise you because it's the same kind of concepts we we've seen before so in the demodulation, it just only have a match filter, or is there any kind of filter? <coughs> there are several filters, right? Where does the match? This is match filter. This one. Because it has like psi one and psi two. And this is match filter, right? right? This correlation here. But I already drew here two filters, and they have distinct names, right? This so is F our front end filter. filter. Front end. Yeah, front end filter. That's the first stage. Right after the antenna, there's a front end filter. It has to be white because if it's not there, this guy will tend to be saturated. It will let all sorts of things, adjacent channel bands, all sorts of stuff in there, and, and usually the power of the signal at this point then becomes really large. I mean, physically, there may not be a component that you can see, and you can say this is a front end filter. A lot of times it's integrated with an LNA, so these two are, are together. But mathematically, there has to be something that protects you from out-of-band interference and out-of-band noise. So that's the first filter. Usually because this frequency that you are receiving is relatively high, you cannot, this guy cannot be of a great selectivity. Right? It cannot just get your signal. You will probably get your signal and a couple adjacent signals as well. That's why there's a need for guard band. Because right? if there's somebody operating different service, you don't want him right against your band because it may saturate your reception. Because it may, you know, and the same it applies to you. You need to move in so that the guy next door can actually operate. Right? Mm -hmm. So because this cannot be of a very high selectivity. Why? Because it operates at a very high frequency usually. Let's say in cellular, can be a couple of gigabits. But then anyway, when you bring it down, this is, this is at, let's say, at 10 megahertz or, or something much, much lower. Then this filter is your main guy. This is the guy that we call this a channel filter or IF filter that only looks at your signal and gets rid of everything else but your signal. And this is a very selective filter. Uh, so this is an IF filter. And this one is present in every receiver. Then we have our match filter, which, you know, if you, if you, if you want to speak about it honestly, it's not really a filter, right? It, it, it is a filter because it's a linear system, but it's, its purpose is not filtering. Its purpose is this, this dot product or, or correlation, right? So it's a correlator. And then when you get it to the baseband, remember what is the result of, of correlator. You're going to get components at the difference of the frequency and the sum of the frequency. So there's going to be a baseband filtering there that will box your signal in the baseband, right? So there's at least four filtering stages if you want to include your match filter as one of the filtering stages. There's your front-end filter, higher filter, match filter, and baseband filter that are in every receiver. Why do we need all those things? Well, I just explained, right? This, one, you need to like this <laughs> one to prevent saturation of your front-end. So that allows you to operate in a in a environment where other people operate. Imagine I'm, I'm receiving here uh, my signal from the base station that may be three miles away, right? And let's say I'm at 2.1 gigahertz, right? At 2.4 gigahertz, there's an access point, right? Only 300 300 megahertz away. So my filter needs to be capable of rejecting that signal. Otherwise, that signal is going to come and, and, uh, and be participate this in this LNA and prevent it from amplifying because the LNA is a, is a relatively uh, dumb device. It just takes whatever comes in and amplifies it. Right? So if lots come in, heat amplification, they drive it into saturation point and all sorts of weird things. So you need a filter that removes majority of the stuff that's not within your band. That's, so that's the purpose of this one, to prevent saturation of this guy. This one here, if I'm receiving a GSM signal, <coughs> is going to be 200 kilohertz wide. It's just going to take my signal and get rid of all the adjacent signals and everything within my band of operation, right? There may be my phone call and your phone call in the same room. It will get rid of your phone call to receive mine, right? Mm -hmm. 
So that's the very, very narrow filter, highly selective filter. This is our correlator, and as a result of the correlation, you get your baseband and components at twice the frequency. The baseband filter removes the twice the frequency components and just lets your baseband signal go through. And then as a result of you know your baseband processing, you may have another additional filter in stages. Like, like you can think of your equalizer as a filter as well. It is really you know a filter that you design based on some training sequence to get rid of the elements of the channel, right? The, the impairments that are in the channel. So there can be other filtering stages, but these four are almost universal in every radio receiver. Okay. All right, so let's stop here. We'll pick up uh, next time. I told you about the midnight. Right. right.